care of the sick and the wounded, even in the middle of the 19th century, was dreadful. You could understand that in wars, for wars bring in their wake pestilence and famine. Wars are associated with dreadful sanitary conditions, soldiers cramped together in dreadful environments, sometimes in dreadful winters, and therefore subject to disease, particularly in the absence of sanitation, nutrition, and clean water, dysentery, typhoid, cholera, and even plague, and most important of all, typhus, was responsible for more deaths in wars than the war itself. It's worth remembering that. One would have expected that things would be better in urban hospitals, but it wasn't so. It was as bad, or almost as bad. If one would enter the hospital, they say, in those times, in that day and age, there was a frightful smell of pus, gangrene, filth. Wounds there would become infected, infection would turn into gangrene, and that would mean death unless if, it, if the gangrene was in a limb and the limb was amputated early enough. As a matter of fact, surgery had a tremendous morbidity and mortality, and many patients who wanted surgery would have it done at home because the mortality at home was at least three times less than that in the hospital. <laughs> One of the reasons for this poor state of affairs was the poor state of nursing. That was when Florence Nightingale now enters history. She lit her way into the hearts of the so many she had nursed and set nursing on a proper foundation and in a proper manner, nursing as we see it right now. It's not that uh, Florence Nightingale started nursing. Caring and nursing was I mean, there right from the time man comes into Homo sapiens, comes into the world. As a matter of fact, I remember the description of Charaka, the qualities of a good nurse. The qualities of a good nurse, he said, that she should be able to administer drugs in the right manner at the right time, that she should be clever, that she should be devoted, and there should be purity in mind and body. That was his, that, these were the attributes he, he gave to a proper good nurse. Now in the Middle Ages, you'd be surprised that nursing was not done by ladies at that time, but by men. In fact, in the Middle Ages, the Knights of the Templars, the, the, the Dominican and the Franciscan churches and nurses were all men, and they tended to all the wounded individuals and the sick individuals during the Crusades. So it's very important to realize that nursing was not only related to women all through the ages. But as far as women were concerned, it was the religious orders, the nuns that were largely responsible for nursing. And it was the church that was responsible for nursing. And all those hospitals, whether they belonged to a religious order or not a religious order, were looked after by these nurses dedicated by the church. And therefore they came to be known as sisters. Now, in, during the, this was during the Catholic period when the whole of Europe was Catholic. But then came the Protestant period, antagonist to the Catholics. And nursing was severed from the religious order. And as a result of that, nurses had to be hired, paid. These were all earlier free nurses. They had to be paid and those who were, those who were picked up were usually not very good not dedicated, not at all worried or devoted, and nursing fell down very badly. There was a slight improvement during the Enlightenment, but then again came the Industrial Revolution, and more women opted to work in industries for the simple reason that they were paid more in industries rather than being devoted as nurses. 
It was Elizabeth Fry in England who first founded an association called the Charitable Nurses Association. And she sent out nurses to women, uh, to, to homes where nurses were needed. But the first great nursing college really was in Germany. It was in a place called Kaiserwerth, founded by a Protestant minister and his wife. This place was converted into a hospital and the deaconesses of the hospital were trained by doctors to become expert nurses. Now we come back to Florence and I think again. Because she was one of the great founders of the nursing profession as we see it now. She was from a fairly wealthy middle class family. The middle class family went on a holiday to Florence and there she was conceived. And that's why she was called Florence. Nightingale. Ever since she was a child, she wanted to become a nurse. As she grew older, she insisted on becoming a nurse. The parents refused till ultimately when she was 34 years old, she consented. They consented. All right, go ahead, become a nurse. She goes to that place in Kaiserwerth, trains there, goes to Paris, works there, and then comes back to London and is made the nursing superintendent at the King's College Hospital in London. Now, sometime in the middle of the 19th century, I think it is 1854 or so, that war breaks out, the Crimean War. The Crimean War between Britain, Turkey and France on one side against Russia on the other side. Russia was a landlocked country at that time, except, remember, that Peter the Great had opened Leningrad, which at that time was called Petrograd or Petersburg, Petrograd, Petersburg. But otherwise, before that, it was completely landlocked, and the Tsars before him had eyed the Crimea because it was near the Black Sea and it would allow them egress to the sea from the Black Sea. So Russia had its ambitions in the Crimean area for a long, long time. But for the balance of power, Turkey, which was the Ottoman Empire at that time, Britain and France opposed Russia and the Crimea War erupted. Hundreds and hundreds of casualties. And it was the first time that reporters were around or were allowed in the theater of war. And for the first time they reported on the war. And in England, this was in English, the first time the English reporters would send reports of the Crimean War back to their native country and their cities in London, cities in Britain, London, Edinburgh, etc. And they reported that once the French wounded soldiers were beautifully looked at by the Sisters of Charity coming from Paris, the British wounded were left to be looked after like animals Deaths were horrendous and they wrote tremendous reports again and again of the dreadful situation of the wounded British in that area. The hospital base, by the way, was called Skutari and it was just across the Bosphorus. The British public was extremely agitated. Why this should be happening? So was the parliament. So they asked Florence Nightingale to take 38 trained nurses to Scutari to see what could be done. So there it was in the tribulations and the death and destruction of war that Florence Nightingale was able to realize her dream to look after and nurse wounded people and ill people. Not just wounds, I told you, all sorts of diseases which I've already mentioned, typhoid, dysentery, cholera, what have you. All of them, in addition to people with wounds. She found that the British soldiers were almost in a hellhole. It was stinking. Excrement along the ground, rats scampering around the ground and nibbling away at the wounded soldiers. Soldiers badly cramped, never dressed, no nutrition. Funnily enough, all windows closed, so there was no ventilation at all. She, with her, so with her nurses, goes to work and completely reorganizes the whole thing, cleans the whole thing, 
opens the windows, ventilates people, changes the sheets, washes, bandages, and the whole place is completely changed. She meets great opposition from the officer staff, a chauvinistic opposition, saying that everything is all right, she's just making a fuss. The, the reporters were there and they reported how good and how changed the situation was ever since Florence Nightingale came to the scene. She, why was she called the lady with the lamp? She was called the lady with the lamp because after working in the day, when everyone was asleep, with her lamp, she would go across the ward, looking at each soldier and seeing if anything needs to be done. And there is a written account, a chronicle, of a wounded soldier who said this, and I quote actually the actual words of that soldier, we lay there in hundreds, and when a shadow fell on us, we kissed that shadow and then put our heads down on the pillow and lay content. So she was a great influence, not only in healing the wounds, but healing the patients as such. The patients loved her and she did this wonderfully well. She returns to London as a heroine, adulated. She raises, the people of London raised 50,000 pounds for her to found the school of nursing. She founds a school of nursing. She designs as hospitals as they should be designed, taking into consideration how good fresh air, ventilation, etc. should be done. She designed, for example, with the architects, St. Thomas's Hospital, one of the early hospitals in London. And she becomes extremely famous. She starts in the school of nursing, training not nurses. She trains matrons, higher qualified, graduates in nursing, matrons. And what she does is she wants the matrons now to teach the new recruits coming into us. That's a wonderful idea. And she sends these trained matrons all over the world, except America. East and West. In the West, in the European countries, and the East, India, Southeast Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, right through. And in fact, one of the first matrons that came to the British Candy Hospital was the product of her school. Nurses, therefore, had a great position now. No longer was in an ignoble profession. It indeed became a very noble profession. But Florence Nightingale was rather frail. She had suffered a long bout of fever during her nursing time in Crimea. Whether it was typhoid or whether it was typhoid, no one knows. She was working very hard. She was writing profusely. Her nursing notes were compulsory reading for all nurses all over the world. She was teaching continuously also. There was, I must admit, a little bit of criticism against her even then. In fact, I have written an essay on Florence Nightingale in my book, Tabiat. And if anyone is interested in the details of Florence Nightingale, you'd probably get it there. She was the first lady who devised statistics when she was in Crimea, giving people who had died of disease who had died of wounds, who had died of whatever it was, given statistics for each month. And she gave statistics not in figures, but in beautiful diagrams. In fact, that was one of her great contributions to the nursing profession. Well, ultimately, she dies, but she was indeed a great woman. It was her obsession, right from a young age, which she pursued right up to the end and pursued it very successfully. It was her ability to combine great care with professionalism, with competence, with ability. It was her great, great contribution that she raised the nursing profession from what it was, an ignoble profession, not to be followed by by women of good families to a noble profession, to a profession equal to that of the medical profession. In fact, she said, 
and very truly and very rightly so, that the doctor and the nurse were both equal partners in caring for the sick. In fact, I would like to quote her exact words, which are so remarkably similar to the words that one speaks of in medicine. She said, and I quote, the art of nursing is nursing the sick. Please note, not nursing sickness. She said, lectures and books are merely auxiliaries that may help. But nursing is taught at the bedside, in the wards, and in the sick room, not from books and not from lectures. This is exactly what medicine is all about. So there you have Florence Nightingale. As I told you, she lit her way into the hearts of all those whom she had nursed and founded the nursing as a profession. Also, she lit her way and she cast a great glow of care on, at that point in time, an uncaring 